Hello, everyone. Thanks for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I am here with... Uh, me, Brandish Gilhelm, uh, Brandon Gillum of Runehammer Games. And today we're going to talk about the Index Card RPG, which I have a copy of. And I'll be honest, when I first saw this, um, and I picked this up, I was like, oh, this looks cool. Wow, how much rules is there? Because this is a, looks like a pretty thick book at first. But the mm -hmm. rules, it's only about... 40 pages, 50 pages at the most. And then the <laughs> yeah. rest of it is just setting and lore. Yeah. Um, so I, I, this is a really interesting book. I'm, the more I'm reading it, I haven't finished reading this yet in its entirety, but the more I'm reading it, the more I'm loving it. It's such a really great system. I, I like, I, I, well, before I get into it, let me ask you this first. How did <laughs> the idea for this come about? Wow. Well, uh, a lot of people ask about like why the title is so weird and you know, why it's sort of silly and where did this all come from? Um, I guess, you know, just as you know, um, I'm just like you, I've been playing forever and it's just always been something I return to is the sort of the game table since I was a kid. I didn't, I don't even think I knew what I was doing for the whole journey. I just was bumbling through life, you know, and I, at some point, um, I guess, you know, you get that thing. Usually it's the players that bring it up. They're kind of like, this is kind of, this is kind of awesome. Like whatever we're doing, it's a little different than what we're reading in our book. And like, you know, like maybe you would have a player that would come from one group, like into my group and, and be a little like, have, like get like a cold pool effect at first and be like, whoa, you guys, this game is kind of crazy and like fast moving. And this is kind of, this is kind of wild. But since I had been slowly boiled in this pot over the course of decades, I didn't notice anything. In my mind, we're just playing like A, D, and D. But my players started bringing it to my attention that we're it's becoming different enough that it might be something that isn't D, &D. and I'd be like, ah, that's just a bunch of hyperbole, you know? And um, so that kind of went on and it started percolating a little bit in my mind of like, you know, because I went back and looked at, especially when 5th edition came out, you know, 5th edition was really exciting and everybody definitely like had a renewed interest, like right when it came out, right at the very, very beginning. And I was like, oh, wow, we do play a kind of a different kind of game with like these dice categories and stuff. And uh, the real turning point as far as like index card RPG and air quotes was a video that I saw by uh, Adam Coble back in the day years ago this must have been 2015 or so um and i have lived and died by the index card like my whole life like i have always loved index cards i hoard them i i use them for everything i make little things out of them i like hide them in the house i like keep my to-do i keep like all my passwords and logins on index cards like i'm i'm a crazy person so i saw this video and adam coble was showing a way that he was just going to sort of get rid of all this sort of complexity in D&D &D when he was releasing Dungeon World. And one of the little tricks he, sh he showed was like, you can have whole campaigns where you like, there's a dragon and you go to this mountain, right? Kind of a little bit funning on Erebor and the Hobbit. And he just takes two index cards. And on one index card, he writes mountain. Not It doesn't even draw do a drawing of a mountain. He just writes mountain. And then on the other index card, he writes dragon and he like slaps them on the table and basically says, you're either on this card or you're on this card. And uh, he was talking about it in like a sort of a narrative sense so that you could split the party so that you could kind of have multi threaded narratives like Frank Menser style. And that's kind of what he was implying. But in my mind, he like reached through the computer and grabbed me by the forehead and like yanked me into my own future. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was like, it, it so clicked in my brain that like, that's kind of what I had been doing for a really long time, but I had never noticed because I was inside my own context, you know, like I, it was just D and D to me. Um, and you know, those, uh, those of us who played since like the eighties uh, or even the seventies, you know, back then, that's kind of how it was because there was no internet. So you just played inside your own hermetic jar. And you, it, for a lot of us, didn't really know how other people played D&D. &D. And that was a little bit of one of these moments. I was like, oh my gosh, like I am weird. 
Like, this isn't just how everyone does it. Like, the index card mindset is sort of my mindset. This is like something I can own. And I started looking out at the world more and researching. And, like, nobody was kind of thinking about how I was thinking about things, you know? Especially, like, if you look at, like, the effort system, like, we had been kind of saying all, like, bladed and blunt weapons are just a D6. We had been saying that for years. Like, years we had, like, compressed that. And I thought everyone did that. <laughs> like, there are people out there rolling like a D10 battle axe. That's crazy. Wow. So once that kind of like dawned on me and I kind of popped out of my little, you know, sealed jar of my own style of D&D &D and looked a little more at the world, I did realize that I had something that was kind of kind of odd and unique. And, and that's where I just wanted to name the book after it the index card became so central that to me that was like a way to differentiate myself you know a lot of games have like these kind of heavy titles um so I, I wanted to just completely open the doors and like let the sun in so to speak <laughs> so, so if i may ask i i find your story very interesting because i remember when i first played uh Dungeons and dragons i remember it was it was i was playing in a game of second edition D and AD and D in a Dragonland setting, and I didn't mm -hmm. realize until much later that when I was playing and learning for the first time, a lot of stuff he was doing was kind of homebrewed. Yeah. So when I, uh, I I I remember buying the player's handbook, but I didn't really read that carefully. So we we um, I sort of played along and added his homebrew, my homebrew of the rules. And what was in the books and kind of made a system together and i didn't realize until maybe a year or so later that maybe there were certain things i was playing wrong and i, I had to go back and check things you know how sometimes players were like hey wait a second this is not in the book and then you kind of yeah. have to was that is that very would you say that's very similar to what you went through kind of like like just for you it's like all right we could play it this way but for me it makes more sense we just kind of like take out all the extra stuff that kind of uh, 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 not brings you down, but uh, uh, this, this, uh, just to make things more easier for everyone. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think not only is that kind of my journey, uh, I think really the five E sort of phenomenon that we've seen in my lifetime as a gamer is the first time I've ever seen it suggested that that isn't the main way. Five uh, E brought this sort of new big culture in who for the first time in my whole experience with all of role-playing was kind of saying like, yeah, you, you play it as it's, as it's written, you play it out of the book because that way we all have a common language and all this kind of, which they're all good arguments, you know, I'm no shade. But to me, that was like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you're actually going to play it the right way. That is freaking crazy. Yo, like, <laughs> and it goes all the way back to us playing rifts. Like in the early eighties, we weren't playing rifts in any way like the way that it's written in the book we were just like inspired by the idea of these kind of weird dimensional things and like cyborg guys the, who, the rest didn't even matter we kind of vaguely understood what this rule book might have been saying but it didn't matter because you know a, a lot of people who are even interested in role playing at all have a little bit of a flair for game design and a little bit of a flair i mean also you don't have to play yahtzee more than twice to be able to invent a game like yahtzee you know, the, the core of all dice based role playing is not, you know, inventing the atom bomb. I mean, it, it is relatively simple stuff like you kind of are succeeding and then looking for quantities. I mean, it's, it's kind of it. Mm. So I think 5e is actually the one of the most outlying uh, game phenomenons that is more sort of played by the book. I think the homebrewing that you describe is is the biggest segment of the hobby. I just don't think it's necessarily that visible. Uh, I think that like, well, like like so much of what we do, the people doing this stuff are not necessarily on the internet. They are not necessarily publicly exposing themselves with their hobby, but mm -hmm. they're there. They're out there, they're painting Warhammer. They're, they're painting half of their Space Marine Army and then putting it in a box. You know, they're they're playing D and D for three or four sessions and then taking a few months off. They're you know they're reading like I don't know they're reading like the Gauntlegrim novel or like a Drist novel 
and then not thinking about it for a year and then playing a few sessions of D&D and homebrewing it. Like the 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 deep hobby to me is very invisible and very hard to see. Um, but I really believe that it's out there and it's huge and it's what you describe. I think you just described the what I think is the biggest segment. I can't really give you the evidence, but in my heart, I think that is the biggest. I don't know about you, but every group I've ever been in, in the first half an hour, 30% at least of the rules are discarded. <laughs> like, in, and I'm talking 15 to 20 minutes, like right away. If it's not on your sheet or something that's happening right away, that's kind of fun. It instantly starts to fade, like, like piercing or bludgeoning, for example, like mm. that, talk about the first thing you don't even toss on purpose. You just don't ever put it in the soup. You, you're mm. like, you know, three years into a D&D campaign and says like, hey, should we use bludgeoning damage? And somebody's like, what is that? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, um, so I, I really believe that that what you describe is, is the doing of it. I, I think that's the main sort of form that D&D is. It's like what Ben Milton called hermetic D&D. It's, you don't really know about other people that much and you modify it to fit your own tastes which you can't do with a board game. Hmm. And this to me is the foundational difference between role-playing and a board game. A board game, you got to play within the parameters or you're just a lunatic and you're just bothering everyone. Hmm. But in a role-playing game, everybody's sitting down knowing some kind of flim-flammy business is going to happen. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it's central. That's a, Let's talk more about this. So anyone that for anyone that's um, discovering this or hearing about this for the first time, how would you best describe the rule system for your game. Mm. Well, index card RPG, uh, I mean, it's a D20 rollover, so it's it's going to be familiar to any D&D player. Uh, that would be my foundational statement. Like you've got the six classic stats from the decades, and you're going to be, you know, given a number like 12, and you're going to try to roll over it with a stat bonus. So at the very core, you know, there you go. And then for, you know, what I call rolling quantities, which is the other big part of like all dice based role playing. It just cooks everything down into categories. So like anytime you're using a weapon, it's a D6. Anytime you are casting a spell, it's going to be a D10. Anytime you're firing a gun, it's a D8. And anytime you roll a, a, a crit, you use a D12 and put it on top. So it kind of boils those questions away. Like, What's the damage on a longsword again? You know, which I don't know. You know, if you've been playing D&D &D for any amount of time, that question, I don't know when it's going to stop coming up. Maybe never. <laughs> I, I think you could be playing with people who've been playing 20 years and they will ask you, uh, what's the damage on a longbow again? Is it the same as a short bow, or is it, I think it's more, but there's some kind of a something. So it kind of cooks all that away um, and then uses a target number instead of variable targets. So that's probably... The essence, as far as mechanics go, um, and what I mean by variable targets is like in D&D, &D, everybody knows about armor class and difficulty class, and those are all over the, the, the map, right? Like, this is harder than that. Uh, and in index card, you really just have one number for huge swaths of gameplay. It could be hours that you're rolling on the same number. And 12 is one of those harmonic numbers. You roll against 12 a lot. Mm. And I think what surprises people is that rolling against a single number is actually great it has just as much variability and just as much suspense and craziness as rolling against variable numbers so mechanically that's its essence um i i don't think that is necessarily what's made it such a huge a huge seller i i think it's probably the the flavor and the tone of it um, I, I kind of hope anyway, I, I'm very proud of the mechanics, but I'm more proud of the voice that it speaks in. And I, it speaks in a very friendly, sharpie kind of voice, you know, like a my uh, it's another thing that's been a staple in my life is sharpies. I've always like just I, I've almost learned to draw using sharpies, which is kind of a crazy. That's so backwards, you know, you really need to learn with pencil. <laughs> but um, to me, there's a there's a mood that comes with a sharpie. That's a very relaxed mood. And, you know, it's like you write the word office on a box when you're moving, you know, that, and that that mindset of writing the word, you know, bathroom on a box, you know, in that kind of 
relaxed sort of font that you write in when you're using a Sharpie. That mm. sort of esoteric feeling that pervades index card RPG of just like, go ahead and just make a quick note on a piece of duct tape. You know, go ahead and draw a smiley face while you're on a phone call. You know, go ahead and draw a shoe on your, you know, tax return up in the corner. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's all good. You know, don't worry about it. And, you know, come on over to my house and we'll figure the rest out. <laughs> and I, I think that that tone has made it really inviting for a lot of people. And, and I think, at least for me, what really draws me to the book is the, the, the design of it's really good. And you, you, men you. you mentioned about the the, the, the tone of, your, of the words in this book. And I think also that has a, a big effect on me as well, because again, it, it, it almost, when I, again, when I saw how thick this was, I was like, ooh, how, is this gonna be very rules heavy? There are rules, but it's not heavy, at least not in the tone and the, and the discussion of it. It's almost like the book is talking to you instead of you reading the book about rules, yeah. if that makes yeah. sense. And I, yeah, I, I, and I think that, that, that came from just a personal desire. You know, as someone who's been reading these damn things for decades, you know, I was kind of like, when is somebody just going to lighten up a little bit here and just kind of talk right to me rather than kind of, you know, dur, 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 and now section one, you know, like, and I'm right away, I'm like, oh my God, oh no, the fanfare. Like, here we go again with this kind of, you know, this high, like Zardoz tone, you know, like there's a stone head floating in the sky telling me how to play D&D, you know, like. You know, whoa, you know, I'm just kind of scared on the ground. And I really wanted to do that thing of like, no, it's all good. And, you know, don't worry about it. Actually, it boils down to some really simple things and we can make it complicated later. But let's just get right into it. Like everybody, you know, you're waking up in the morning and like roll constitution to see how, you know, did you eat the bad chicken? You know, is your, is your stomach rumbling to start that? And right away, everybody's like, what's constitution? <laughs> you know what I mean? So like that, that kind of mood, I think, is is at its core. Mm. And and the, the, the art design and the way it's put together is really, really nice. It it, it sort of reminds me a little bit of um, Dark Horse, um, uh, Mike Magnola's design work. Just a little bit. This reminds me of it. The Hellboy stuff. Uh, the wow. B PRD, if I'm, yeah. Hopefully, I'm saying the initials right. You know, this, that's what it reminds me. Of. So it has that really, you know, it's it's. I love that. Yeah, the it's the book is talking to you as a friend, as someone that that wants you to have fun. But the art style is almost like, yeah. But remember, this is this this. You're also um, about to head into some very interesting adventures, very dangerous adventures. So yeah. I love the the almost like the. The, I don't want to say it's contrasting the tones. Not really. It's it's almost like you're. Um, it really feels like you remember how like in the Dungeon Drag cartoon they're going down that uh, the 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 roller coaster. Uh, they're yeah. going down and things are it's getting crazier and crazier. That's what it feels like. Hey, this should be a simple <laughs> ride, but now it's going. It, it's I don't know. I, I think that's why I'm enjoying this so much. It's 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 almost like I'm reading. Um, well, I don't want to say like a, like an adventure story, but it just it feels like like I'm gonna be part of something big. You know, awesome. you know, but I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I could I could go on forever. How much I'm starting, how much I'm really liking this book. Um, I, I think, too, that that also just came from, I guess, like they say, you know, being a customer of your own work. You know, so I when I was when I'm looking at adventure books, which I've been or, you know, rule books, which I've been doing since like I can remember. It's like one of the first things I really remember getting into. Um, I, I was like wanting it. I was wanting um, a little more of this roller coaster you described, you know, like, yeah, let's start with some kind of some cardboard pop outs. And then there's like a waterfall that we go down and then we're like in the cave, you know, and um, I often feel that there's this strange stuffiness in so many books. They w they almost won't let themselves make that kind of wild ride occur. They're like, they're sort of busy worrying about the naysayer. I, I really think uh, tons of books are written for the critical reader, not for the enthusiastic reader. Mm. And so they're they're countering the the argument that may be levied in the future with their writing. And and this is common. This isn't like something that I'm unique for thinking. This is definitely the way that a lot of games are written: is that you you foresee the deepest critique that could be brought. 
and you write against that critique. And that way you're covered, you know, you're kind of, you're good. You have a tight system. But to me, this is kind of a dark way of thinking. Uh, you know, I think that, and there's a lot of like little air leaks in ICRPG that numerous people have pointed out over the years. Um, and a lot of the things I write have little air leaks in them. Full disclosure, because I'm a little more busy, like sort of, you know, kind of towing you down into this sort of place that I'm in and trying to get your head in the tone and trying to like entice you and kind of like, you know, make little fireworks go off on the sides. Um, and I, I want that to come through. And sometimes at the expense of complexity and perfection, I would say, uh, if some rules lawyer people were to look at my writing. Um, but yeah, to me, that that feeling of excitement and enthusiasm is like what I'm all about. That to me is the root of everything. Mm. Let, let's talk about your, your magic system. Uh, how, how would you best describe it? Well, I've got two options. So in the beginning of the book, you kind of get the basic version. And this is just roll to cast, and which also blows some people's minds. You just roll to cast and like have at thee. Um, and you do a, a single die of output with whatever you may be. If you're healing, you know, it's one of those die and so on and so forth. Then in the back of the book, you have like the magic system. Uh, so in the early days of ICRPG, that was a separate book. Um, basically at the behest of fans. So readers and fans wanted this kind of bigger, more complex, you know, mat, like grimoire kind of vibe. I was like, ooh, that's really fun to get really into there. You know, like a lot of magic using readers want to get deeper and get more into things. And then that grew and was maybe a little overly complex or maybe a little heavy. And that grew and became the refined version that's in Master Edition now that, that we're talking about. And that one is basically a sort of a give and take system. So it's like giving up either sort of a stun or you can use hit points as a resource and then building spells in power levels and their cost increases um, and even getting guaranteed casts rather than all rolls and then, you know, getting multiplicative outputs. And then also specializing into schools to reduce costs and all these kind of things that I think advanced spellcasting players come to love because they love to show off their gadgets at the table. That is something that I think all wizard players have shared since the beginning of time is that you guys hold my beer, you know, <laughs> check this out. And they're like, I thought you already cast Fireball. And I was like, yeah, but see, I got this loophole. <laughs> you know, like, and... <laughs> Just here's my real thing, you know what I mean? And so finding those synergies and making up those gadgets for that particular player type, I think a lot of people just breeze right over the magic section in ICRPG. But for that particular player, I wanted to provide that ability to create gadgets um, in a spell sense. And that's kind of its foundation, is it's a, it's a cost and output balancing act, um, which since I did that has now sort of started to pervade more of my writing. Um, and uh, toward the end of the book, you have these five huge settings that you can choose from um, to play in. Um, if I may ask, where um, I'm, I'm really glad that you, that it's included because this book feels complete. Uh, sometimes when you read a book and you realize, okay, this is probably going to be uh, another book and another book, another book, which is fine. I, I love books. I'll collect as many as, as I can. Um, mm -hmm. But this feels very complete, especially with the five settings at the end. Was that something... Um, you were going for you were hoping for like all right this is not only just a, a, a great new rule system but here are the different worlds you could just play them in and and just yeah. go wild and again in the beginning it was a separate book and i'll tell you as a business decision making a truly complete book is is like ill-advised so <laughs> it's such a terrible idea as a business decision because i and the open statement of this book was I don't want to make more. And it isn't because I'm abandoning index card RPG. You know, I would never abandon it, but I did want to do exactly what you're describing. I, I again, as a customer, I wanted that complete book. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of crazy though. It is kind of like making a business statement with a, with a rule system and saying like, you know, <laughs> there it is. I said, I won't make more. So I, I'm not gonna kind of crazy. Um, especially because the scale of index card RPG and its readership is so big. It's, you know, a little makes me kind of, you know, it's a bit of a face palm. 
But from the reader's point of view, that's not a bad decision at all. It's really cool, as you mentioned. And yeah, I think uh, as as things grew, Worlds was the second book I released after the core. And as that readership really started to go up like a hockey stick kind of curve, I think that was when it started to get in my head of it would be really neat to get through what I consider the essential books and then combine them and revise them and clean them and really get that that one master book. And that idea between its inception and its delivery was, uh, I don't know, around three years or so. So it definitely took a lot of time to get everything to sort of fit um, and bring everything into line. And a lot of art had to be done. Um, but I, I I always wanted that, I guess. I just always wanted a book where, you know, and I, I got to call Games Workshop out on this one. Sorry, guys. You guys are the meanest with this. So you get the core and you give me nothing. Like right at the end of the core, I don't even get one army. Like it, it really breaks my freaking heart. <laughs> so so I, I know that people, like you said, still love to collect. Um, but as someone who's felt that pain uh, of like needing to get the next book and then the next one and so on and so forth, I, I did want to try to squanch it all down. And I think I was also inspired by GURPS. Um, who GURPS was a crazy one because they simultaneously in the opening offering, Steve Jackson said, here's everything you need to make any setting you can dream up. And then on the exact opposite note, made more setting books, maybe than ever any system ever made. Like there, there were so many, there was like river punk i mean it got so completely out of hand with how many gurp settings there were but in my mind i don't know if i ever bought a single gurp setting book but we played in the gurp's core book the original one from way back in the day for quite a while we actually sort of fused it into fantasy hero which is like i don't even know what we were thinking i don't know what how much of either we we're actually using but um, and I really liked that. I liked the opening tone of GURPS, where he was saying, yo, you know, like, D&D is cool, and it's over here, and Fantasy Hero is cool, Palladium is cool, Merp is cool, TMNT is also kind of neat. But with GURPS, you know, come on into my living room. Let's, like, figure out our own kind of mashup of these. I really liked that. Now, GURPS turned out to be quite clunky in the grand scheme of things, but was revolutionary to me in its day. Um, it's easy to be critical of it now, but to me, GURPS was really formative. So I was trying to kind of do what that first GURPS book did. Mm. You know, let me ask you something. I, I sometimes when I hear about the index card RPG, some people tend to label it, label it as OSR. And I'm not sure if I agree with that, because when I think of OSR, I think of the purpose of it is um, Right. Anyone that doesn't know, I'm talking about. I'm talking about old school, uh, old school revival, old school renaissance. Yeah, uh, the art keeps changing. Uh, <laughs> old school <laughs> renaissance, and um, I don't see it that way because I, when I think of it, I think of maybe just a, like a, a variation of the basic D and D system, or maybe a variation of the uh, uh, events Dungeons and Dragons system. Um, but let me ask you this: Do you see it that way as well? Do you do you see it as not a, a how do you see your game exactly when it comes to yeah well i definitely definitely don't see it as osr i think that is uh i think even just the term i'm a little bit known for this on the internet but i even think the term is just goofy and means nothing i i think it's a term that's usually slung around if you weren't actually there in like the early 80s or even late 70s because the people who were there were vastly varied the the number of styles in the sort of early era was so diverse that to say something is old school to me is extremely useless to say. If you were to say something like vintage D&D, &D, okay, that's very specific. But uh, I don't know about you, but you know, back in this so-called OSR era, there was like paranoia, there was rifts, there was tune, like, has, has anybody remember Toon? Because that was the same period that people are talking about this OSR thing. And it was not like gritty black and white art and like dangerous dark dungeon. No, it was literally like Animaniacs 15 years before Animaniacs existed. Like 
the 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 sort of OSR period was so diverse and so weird that to call anything old school to me is just goofy. Now, if you want to be specific, then that's different, and I'm totally on board. And I I definitely don't see anything about index card RPG being old school. I, I if if we could have had the mindset of index card RPG in the early '80s, we would have been. 20 or even 30 years ahead of where the thinking of the hobby was because this is why like rifts and gurps are great examples again people are so mean to rifts and gurps there's they 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 mock them you know like how they're overly clunky and complicated and it's difficult and it's like doing your taxes and all this stuff but in the day this was cutting edge thinking and it was great it was awesome and you homebrewed it to fit and i think that it takes a lot of development of thinking, you know, from the the sort of the really the birth of the hobby in the sort of early 70s, like with with Menser and Arneson playing together and stuff. It took a lot of thinking to get to streamlined concepts. So to call streamlined concepts old to me is just bizarre. It, it's almost like so strange, you know, it's like these electric engines and cars, man, are they old school? It's just like, what? No, <laughs> they were so hard to come up with, you know? Well, they're so simple. And it's like, but that's what's hard to come up with. It's the simplicity, <laughs> the complex, you know, the steampunk era is old school, you know, where you have like all these bells and whistles and levers and gears and pulleys. That's old school. And, you know, simple streamlined things are, are more new. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. that. I think OSR is just cool to say. And it definitely feels cool to say. It's just like hip-hop, right? When you say something's old school, you're like, oh, damn. Or like a hitman. If a hitman's old school, that's like, you better run. Like, it's going to be bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's not going to, like, have feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so I think old school just is kind of a little bit of a code word for badass. Um. So I'm just going to run with that. So thank you, people, for calling ICRPG <laughs> old school because it is badass. <laughs> there we go. Boom. <laughs> Nothing but net. <laughs> yeah, it, it's strange. I, I think sometimes people, when they see, cause I think again, we your 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 system. This system here is, I think, very easy to learn, and and character creation is very quick. Um, but I think when people see that, they think, uh, oh, it's just like the old days, and and. You know, which is weird because not all games back then were like, all right, Palladium, for example. If you made a character, hope you have two hours of time, because that's yeah. that's what you're going to be doing, making characters, and which... and a strong imagination, and good reading skills, and mm. good referencing skills, and good note keeping skills, and like you want to make a yeah, like Palladium is a great example. You want to make like a proper TMNT character, like let's let's hang out for an afternoon. Like I'm mm. thinking Otter Man, bro. Okay, yeah. well, let's get into this Otter Man. And, you know, you got to get all your structural damage. You got your structural defenses and all this craziness. And it's all calculated and has costs and stuff. And, like, that's old school, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like that Hitman who's got no feelings, you know. Like, old school, now that I think about it more, really might just be a catch-all term for, like, you know, back in the badass days. Hmm. And in that sense... I guess that is a cool term to use, you know, but trying to describe the the old days, you know, the 70s and early 80s with any generalization, I think is really hard to do. Um, it was it was weird. It was a crazy time. Indeed, indeed. I, I really love the era we're living now for games. Uh, it, it's just better research. So many multitude of different games to try out yeah. and systems to learn like like this one <laughs> yeah the, um, the reading availability nowadays is is probably my favorite part i'm not a, to be honest not a huge fan of how much like internet exposure there is right now to like opinion hmm. i think sometimes that's a little bit of a buzzkill um but you know that's part of our modern era you know like the, our our knowledge saturation can be a little bit of a buzzkill so it was a little more magical in some ways in the more isolated days, but just as a voracious reader, like I'm sure both of us are, uh, it, it's a great time to be a reader because there's just so much. You can go down the weirdest rabbit hole imaginable, and there are like 20,000 people out there 
who are eager to hang out with you and read about, you know, how to restore 15th century bagpipes or I don't know, whatever the weirdest thing is you can think of, you know, like raising ducks, you know, there's like 50,000 people out there talking about your best practices for raising ducks. You know, it, it's crazy how how special interest you can do rabbit holes of research right now, which is sort of one of my biggest things I do for fun. It sounds kind of silly now that I say it out loud, but um, yeah, as, as a reader, absolutely great. Mm. Getting back to the index card RPG, and I apologize, I know I, I, we've been going on uh, tangent. I'm just enjoying this conversation a lot. We got to bring um, it back. We got to bring it back. <laughs> no ducks. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, no it's, it's great to talk to someone that I think it looks like we this we had this weird parallel um of discovering that of of how we're discovering games and what we play back then so it's good to talk to someone that oh, pretty much played the same games i did growing up awesome. you know? but cool. um, but going back to this um i really like your monster creation system um that's one of the reasons why i feel like it feels very complete because even there is a bestiary but um but if if people want to go on and find more things there's rules here to create your own monsters. Mm -hmm. um, can, can, I, can I ask you, like, what was uh, uh, the creation process behind your monster creation system? Yeah, well, again, trying to come from a place of appreciating the people around me and the people around me being really what this is, right? So if you start that as your sort of premise anytime you're about to write a block, okay? So I'm, it's time to do all these monsters, okay? Like, every book needs some. Um, all right, I got to write these down. I got to organize it pretty good and stuff. But, you know, I got a few ideas of my own. But again, that the root point being people, the people right around you, the people that are looking right at you, the, you know, the, the real experience from two days ago, you know, and when you look at, at, at those experiences as your root, one of the first things that, that I noticed and that I still believe to this day is like, how many people actually just like have the the page open to the monster at hand and are actually delivering that sucker point by point properly as it's written to the table and my answer is going to be like somewhere approaching zero it's a calculus it's not an absolute number <laughs> but it is a curve approaching zero it's like narrow in there and that isn't because of disrespect for material or because of lack of a capability on the side of the GM or anything like that. It's just more fun to be in the moment and also to have unique things popping up. So I know there is a group of like, you know, the, the RAW kind of group. So like, well, we beat a night hag. All right, let's, let's do the hag thing. So we beat a night hag and we played it like straight out of the manual. And so we can, we get the boy scout badge. We beat it as it's written. That is definitely a culture. But in my experience, the, well, this is actually, this is, this is Blue Ear. And she is sort of part night hag, but she's also like that crazy shopkeeper that you saw last week from like the, the apothecary. It's her, right? And right away when the GM or the group is having these kind of revelations and these funny sort of, you know, uh, MacGuffins popping out. It's different than what's going to be written. You know, she's going to look like the vendor that sold you potions last week. And she's going to have these little details and foibles that fit her into what's happening in the moment. And I, I would like to call people out right here. But my guess is 90% of the time or more, the GM's going to, their gaze will slowly lift from the night hag entry in front of them on their notes or in a book. Their gaze will lift and return to the people at the table and the board that they're looking at, or the miniatures, and it will veer away from that fixed sense of what this foe would be. And it's even as simple as something saying like, oh yeah, these are goblins, but these fools are tiny. <laughs> like, wait, what? Yeah, these are like, I don't know, man, they're like barely two feet tall. You, you can't look into the book and get like a two foot tall goblin and play it sort of by the book. You are right. You are off in the weeds. And so what I wanted to do with Index Card RPG is say, hello, friend. I'm like you. I tend to make almost everything. Even when I wrote all these monsters for this book, I got to come clean with y'all. I will probably make most of my monsters on the spot. 
because the spot will call for something I didn't quite see coming or that is unique. And I'll make the monster right in front of my players. It doesn't need to be some kind of secret layer BS where I'm some kind of mastermind with all this hidden knowledge or something. I, I just don't believe in it. I'm right here with you guys. Uh, I'm thinking you guys like this guy should have like maybe eight hit points. Does that feel about right? And everybody's like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. And I want to give him two attacks because he seems really fast. Is that is that cool to everybody? And they're like, yeah, yeah. Oh, he he should definitely have two attacks. All right, cool. But I'm going to want to make one of them a little bit of a surprise. And I'll make a note. And we're done. we've just made a monster together as a table in less time than it takes to take a turn. Hmm. You know, and that, to me, happens more than I think people even see in themselves sometimes. I think they do it and they forget or don't notice they're doing it. Um, but having the courage and encouraging people to have that courage is is what I sort of stand for. And I, I hope that that comes through the pages of like ICRPG Monsters. It's like, do this thing. Not only are you cool, like, this is the way. Like, go forth with confidence. You don't need to know anything. But here are a bunch of ideas for monsters just to put in your subconscious. Take all those ideas as you will. But in the moment, you know, and if, you know, if you talk to my players, which as my sort of my profile grows a little bit online, more people do talk directly to my players without me around, which is bizarre. But, you know, they really like this stuff. They like to not know how many of them they're going to be, how big they are, how good their weapons may be. If one of them is really super quick or is like bigger than the others, they don't know because we don't really play out of the book. So even if we come up on something like a skeleton, <clears throat> like we did Monday night, you can't just say, oh, we've encountered skeletons before. Yeah, they have five HP. They're really slow. You know, they have these rusty swords that only do D4. It's no big deal, bro. No. When we encounter skeletons, we have to ask again, like, oh, what do, what do these guys look like? And they're like, okay, let's, and we do like binary choices. Well, are they small or big? And I go, uh-oh, they're kind of big. Do they have like rusty weapons or do they have like weird, like nice weapons from some kind of armory that they found? We roll for that too or flip a coin like, oh no, they got the good weapons. Like, and how many of them are there? I don't know, like 2d6 maybe? Oh crap, we got a seven. Hmm. You telling me there's seven of these big suckers? So it could have been two wimpy little skeletons or it could have been 12 big ones. And I don't know the outcome any more than my players. And that, to me, that's ma that's monster making right there. Now, you can have a lot of other systems and ideas like ICRBG does, but that mindset is what I want to invite people to do without shame or hesitation. You're not homebrewing. You're not being a weird hacker. You're just role playing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I if I may ask, is there do you have I mean so you have five different settings almost almost like five different like uh, modern future uh, Alfheim is my personal favorite but I'm I'm always leading toward um, mm -hmm. uh, fantasy um, yeah do you do you have a, a personal favorite that you go to at times for your games or is it always is it as random as the monsters you make mm -hmm. or uh, what what do you prefer. Hmm. Well, I'm I'm a little bit like you. I I think fantasy is the most the most vacation like setting. You you get a lot of good release from our modern world when you go into a fantasy world. You know, it's there's a lot of grass, and there you know you can kind of walk anywhere you want, and there's not a lot of like phones ringing and stuff. You know, it's a very pleasant place to be. So I really love fantasy and I feel like we have like a, a, a communal imagining of fantasy that's really deep thanks to Tolkien and, and you know, just our general myth of our society. <clears throat> so I, that definitely where I live, but I also live in a sort of multiverse in almost everything I do. So like there are always, you know, like Frank Menser said, there's always an alien race dragging a meteoroid above a fantasy world. You know, whether or not you have access to that, there's definitely aliens dragging asteroids around in the orbit of the planet because there's precious minerals on that asteroid. And uh, that, the, that he told me that at um, PageCon a couple of weeks ago. And I just loved that, you know, because I asked him about blending sci-fi and fantasy. And his answer was, yeah, there's always this kind of 
you know, this meteor with all this adamantium in it. And it's kind of up there. Well, now, whether or not your players interact with it, you know, that's a little bit of a different question, but it's there. And I, I loved that idea of just how to him, it was just like, yeah, it's just like green beans with potatoes. I mean, of course there's sci-fi and fantasy. So I'm kind of part of that. There's always a, <clears throat> there's always like a buried ship. Um, there's always a weird piece of metal that fell from space, um, which is, you know, Dave Arneson's kind of invention with the, uh, the Isle of the Toads or the Isle of Frogs, Temple of the Frog God or whatever. I think Temple of the Frog God, that's it. That's where there's the buried ship underneath the Frog Temple and they have ray guns and stuff. And that's like one of the first adventures. So to me, it's foundational to, to at least have two worlds. And they are blending in some kind of strange and mysterious and unstable way. Um, the other ones get a little more out there, you know, like Ghost Mountain and superheroes. They're a little more like specialty cuisine. Um, so we we probably play a little less of those. But sci-fi, fantasy, or in ICRPG terms, Warp Shell and Alfheim, we, we're always living in that that little riptide between those two. That's like our that's our milieu in our games. You know, it, it, hearing you talk about it, it just occurred to me that, so when I look at these five settings, I, I saw them as individual separate settings, but just sort of common sense now after hearing you talk about it, that these are also made that to be immersed with one another. Yeah. And the book actually offers the linkage. So we have this thing that's kind of a myth in the in the sort of ICRPG fan base, I guess you could call it called the wizard lock and the wizard lock is the symbol that's on the cover and this symbol <clears throat> this symbol is the link between the worlds and if you find it as a group during play there is a way to sort of go through it or or unlock it to 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 move between like alfheim and ghost mountain to go into the weird west and then return you know and and uh you mentioned the D and D cartoon, you know, like the roller coaster was the wizard lock, mm. you know, for reasons that were never explained either. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was because Venger was like messing around with the human world, and he sucked the kids in. I guess that was the explanation. So, so Venger was on the other side in the fantasy world, sort of casting a wizard lock, not really knowing what was on the other side, and then because he was always the stupidest villain ever created, he accidentally cast it like right on a. D and D roller coaster ride. Like, what are the odds? <laughs> I know it's getting close to to our hour. Um, is there anything about this that you want to share about your game that I haven't asked you about? Oh wow. Well, I guess um, for people that are just newly discovering it and stuff, um, and people who've been around a while, you know, we got some people who've been playing ICRPG now, coming up on seven years. Um. I guess what, what I would like people to know the most is that there's continuity. Um, I think a lot of times, uh, I guess what we call creators nowadays, not necessarily authors, that word seems a little bit out of fashion, but uh, I think there's a perception that a creator sort of makes something, and then if something new is offered, that the other thing has been moved on from, you know? And And we definitely have precedent for this in the creative world, right? Sometimes you get like, you know, you'll get Picasso who will basically want to burn everything in his previous period, right? Because he's moved on to his hat period and now he's making hats and anything that's not a giant parade hat, which was one of his coolest periods, by the way, if it's not a parade hat, it, I didn't even do that art. It's horrible, right? So we do have like precedent for this kind of mindset from an artist or an author. But I guess my message would be that there is a lot of continuity, between the very first things that I published as Runehammer, which I've been I've been writing and making things way before that, but the very first things that I did as Runehammer are really connected to the the things that I'm releasing this week. Um, and that connectivity may not be obvious to the newcomer, and they may think like, oh yeah, well I got ICRPG, but Runehammer's like moved on to other stuff, and I. Uh, make no mistake, have totally not moved on. There is a, there is weird, you know, fibrous connective tissue that is just getting stronger and stronger between all of these sort of aspects. Um, you know, like the Warp Shell universe, uh, 
the the techniques described in index card RPG are almost for like the GM techniques. They're almost assumed for anything new that I write. It's almost assumed that you read like ICRPG as your 101 course. Um, and it, it's not that I want to present some kind of, you know, decades long, you know, masterpiece or something. That isn't really what I'm saying. It's just, I want that reader to feel comfortable and to know that like, my den is still open. You know, the fire is still going here. You know, I haven't, just because ICRPG is, you know, seven years old or whatever, you're not in the old part of Runehammer. You're in the current part. You're you're right in the flow. And honestly, if you jump into my sort of online communities, ICRPG is, is probably still my most played system as Crown and Skull starts to sort of arise from the shadows. But I, I it isn't necessarily even because... I want the sales to continue or I want the the foundation to hold strong or something. It's more, again, just this sort of this comfort kind of invitation feel. You know, like I guess, like I said earlier, like come over to my house and let's like sit down for a minute and cool off from our lives and then we'll figure the rest out. It'll be great. Whatever we do. Hell, we play AD&D. It's fine. And, and like a lot of what you maybe want to get into with Runehammer will still be there. It'll still come through the DNA of of whatever we may do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's something I really just want to extend to the hobby world itself is is that mood, you know, of like a crackling fire and like an old table, you know, and some notebooks and fountain pens and some dice and like you know, a cool bookshelves that are behind you to get that, you know, the the emanation of books, you know, being near books has a certain something to it. And then from there, it could be almost anything. Um, and, and that's something I really just always want to like broadcast. So that's the connectivity between talking about ICRPG and talking about like what's happening like this week with Runehammer. And so if people are just now, like you said, you're not even quite done reading Master Edition. Like, you're that exact person, my man. Like, like welcome. <laughs> you know, get in here, and let's argue if 12 is too low of a default. You know, like should 14 be? You know, how hard do you like your game? Is 10 the magic tipping point? It's like flipping a coin. I don't know. We've been talking about it for ages. How do you do dual wield? We've been talking about that for five years straight. So, like, jump in here. And and you're you know everyone's welcome sort of. I think dual wield is one of those things that always crop always comes up in every game I've ever played. You know, like, absolutely. Okay, like how can I use two pistols? You know, what's is there yep. rules for that? And then you have to check and see. But uh... <laughs> and, and it's and it should come up because it's freaking cool. <laughs> like I mean, let's face it. Like the barbarian with two battle axes, the gunslinger with his hat pulled down and two pistols and. It's cool. So mm -hmm. let's figure it out for our table. It should be a perennial topic. And, and again, that's that mood, right? Like acknowledge that it's cool. And sure, we can use the AD&D rule for it. Why not, man? I mean, I, I don't have any beef here. I don't have like some kind of vested interest, like where I'm going to be like, uh oh, -uh, no, we got to do it this other way. Like, I, what kind of, no, no, we're friends at this table. Like, you want to do it a certain way? Great. <laughs> like, killer, man. Write it on a card. Keep it, you know, near your work area there so we're consistent with it. And all right, what next? You know, what next should we figure out? We Looks like we got a gunslinger over here. What do you guys think? Is that fit what we're imagining? You know, are we, are we doing a gunslinger thing all of a sudden? And like, that's just going with it and being friends rather than, I think some of this I don't honestly think it's even necessarily that real that our hobby is so strict. You know, I think maybe the internet has has presented this thing of like, oh, well, you know, shame on you, doody do, finger wagging. I honestly think that's just kind of like keyboard courage talking. I, I think in, in when you really sit down with friends, with strangers, it might be different. But when you sit down with friends, you respect what they have to say, no matter what bucket it may fall into. And and there's a flexibility and a comfort and a give and take there that that is the game. And I just want to be a voice that reminds everybody about that, that that maybe we don't see that all the time, but it's there. <laughs>
<laughs> it's here. Like it's at my house. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 is next for Runehammer? Um, is there anything on the horizon that you that you're they can, they can share? Oh yeah, nothing going on over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, really, twenty four is kind of the the year of lunacy over here. So, in the immediate short term, Crown and Skull um, is my new like. It's going to be five volumes, and it's sort of probably my most ambitious project of them all, but also sort of that has this sort of historical thing I've been wanting to do for a long time. Like it's a very old book kind of a feel, um, like old in terms of centuries, not decades. And it has just arrived, like the, the literal ship made landfall like three days ago and it should be ready to go out to everybody at the end of the week. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, the PDF has been a, out a while for people and stuff like that, but PDFs never have much sticking power. They don't really generate a lot of interest. So we've been waiting for this big shipment. And um, so that's going to, that's about to sort of catch fire. So insanely excited about that. Not at the, it's too far behind on its heels. We have Scotty's third book in his Easy D6 system, which is his post apocalypse world called Wasted World. And uh, Scotty is a lunatic. His imagination is absolutely wacky. And so what I've done is I take his raw writing and I kind of rewrite it, put it in layout, give it art and publish it. So I serve almost as a custodian of Scotty's imagination. Um, and that book is going to be ready to go here in a couple of weeks. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, and then the, the biggest one, obviously, which I guess is the sort of the real murmur, is that that I am opening a bookshop here in Philly this spring. So uh, the lease is all signed. We're doing the construction right now on the interior. Um, it's quite nerve wracking and kind of one of the craziest sort of swan dives I've ever done. But like so many role players and, and readers out there, you know, like having a cozy little bookshop has always been a dream. Um, and I'm going for the dream. So really that is the hugest thing on my horizon right now. Um, and, you know, it's also because, uh, again, kind of, I'm going to go ahead and point a finger a little bit, but a lot of what have been com come to be called game shops are not what are inviting to me. Uh, I am not welcome in a way. I am not welcome where, you know, and no shade against playing Magic the Gathering. I know people love it, but I'm not really part of that. And, I'm not really in that world and it kind of has taken over what used to be like D and D shops or, or bookstores. They almost felt more like bookstores in my day. Um, and I want to bring that back. I want that, you know, that kind of book vibe with a sort of, you know, like a cozy reading chair vibe um, and more of a reader mindset. So, you know, game stores rock on, but you kind of turned into a thing where I don't necessarily like to be there. You know, it's like fluorescent lights and sort of like bright colored carpet and stuff. And yeah, I don't know if I have like a sensory neuro problem, but when there's like fluorescent lights and weird carpet, I, I can't hang out. I, I'm like, I'm out of there. That's why cons generally kind of blow my mind a little bit. I, I just, I just can't, I can't chill with it. <laughs> mm. So one of my goals with this shop is to make, you know, like a nice moody space that really is probably kind of a little more adult um, and is about books and curating reading. As a, And I want to bring the zine culture back. I know that zine culture lives on the Internet, but no, I want to go up to a big ass rack of zines and I want to check them out. I want to I want to touch them. <laughs> like, I don't want to download them. I want to touch them and look at them and sit in a chair and give one a little bit of a read. Like, so that's kind of the, the big dream of the, of the Runehammer bookstore. Um, and then I guess if there's one more thing I can kind of plug and mention, um, it is uh, again, something that took ages to do, but just what, four days ago, five days ago, I did get the final production set of the Runehammer, the official dice set. Ooh. So the world is jam-packed with dice. There are a trillion dice to choose from. And so I didn't want it to just have like the Runehammer label on it and say like, it's the Runehammer set, like, because I just said it is. 
I actually wanted to look at like all the thousands and thousands of dice sets I have and think, you know, what could be next? You know, what could be something that would, that I would really treasure out of this? And it's not, it doesn't have to be, you know, like expensive or something to be a treasure. It, it needs to answer to the true player who plays like twice a week or more, <clears throat> you know, like what, what does that player need or want in a dice set? And I've been working with only crits, and I, I think I'm probably their most difficult client they've ever had. So we started this process in July, if you can believe it. And we have gone back and forth over and over and over since July. By the way, Eric, if you're listening to this, thank you for your patience um, until just now. So se almost seven months, six, six and a half months. <clears throat> um, and then we finally got the set where I got him in the Ziploc bag and I'm just like, ah, we got it. We finally did it. So those are now going into production. So in a, a couple of months here, six weeks to two months, those will arrive. We got a thousand sets coming. So I'm really excited about that. I, I truly believe that like dice are a little bit like books in some cases where they play to an ideal that may not be that kind of blue collar D and D player ideal. You know, which I don't mean blue collar in an economic sense. I mean, blue collar in a in a in a grind sense, you know, like the, the true heads out there are playing every damn week at multiple tables and carrying their sh to their friend's house. And like the, the struggle is real, like and like hard to read dice or like overly fancy dice or overly heavy or overly pointy. They're all stressors to the to the weekly grinder kind of player. Um, and I want to speak to that player. That's like, those are my people. Mm -hmm. And they're not the hugest segment of the hobby by any means. You know, I guess what some people would call hardcores. Mm -hmm. um, but those are my people. Those are the people that I want to speak to. And these dice are for those people. And, and like, I'm really proud of this creation. So those are like the big things coming here at the beginning of the year. So I'm I'm kind of like my head's spinning a little bit. I know you talked about um your 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 personal dream being the bookstore. My dream is to have a a, a large bin like Scrooge McDuck. But instead of money to jump in, it'll be dice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm excited. About and then the he's doing he's doing the backstroke and he like spits them out. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm excited about your dice set. That's really awesome. Um, and and cool. your bookstore. Now I have some place to go to when I uh, check out Packs Unplugged. So that's yeah, yeah. And that's we actually want to run. So we I did get a big enough space that we have like an event kind of area. Um, so we want to you know maybe have a war game event now and again, but then also put in chairs and do you know like have Scotty come to town and you can come and you know do us do a little D and D weekend with Scotty and stuff. But obviously any of the Philly cons we will be live and direct, you know, so we'll be offering that other place to go in Philly when you're a little bit cooked on the con and ready for the second location, you know, come on over. And we're really looking forward to that. And we'll be, um, by the time uh, Unplugged comes back to town, we'll be absolutely humming by that point. We won't be at the beginning anymore. So um, we are super duper excited about when that day comes, about having probably some person in like a wizard suit over at PAX Unplugged to guide people over to the shop, you know, like it's something, I don't know, some guy in like a hoagie costume. I don't know what we're going to do, but yeah, I think, I think a lot of people are kind of having that idea. Like let's go to PAX Unplugged and then go to Rune, Rune Hammer and go check it out. So really looking forward to that dream. Mm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about index card RPG very awesome i'm enjoying this so much um you mentioned um easy d6 and that's mm -hmm. something next i was gonna check out after reading this especially i was like oh i gotta check out these other books food hammer puts out if, you know this is great i'm wondering what the other books are like yeah um, yep yeah, i'm i'm a huge fan of scotty scotty is my predecessor you know sort of on youtube um and also just just as a person i just really like his style he keeps a pretty low profile these days um which I also respect a lot. Uh, and I, I think the, the, the soul of his sort of bright heart really comes through in his, in his work. And it's been like a real privilege to curate and, and refine and be a custodian of the way that he sees things. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, yeah, I just could not respect a person more than Scotty. Mm. Well, viewers, um, thank you for watching. I hope this is informative. I will put a link in the description below. This is available at Drive to RPG. Well, Diffius is also distributing this, which is awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Put all that below in the description. Yes, viewers, thank you for watching. Stay safe out there. We'll see you next time. Thanks for having me.